this is the last of the four part series we started the series on deciphering china in uh, in september and we had one program every month the four part series and i must credit mr pratap heblika for being the key catalyst to drive this along and of course we had great support from komodo vasan of the chennai center for china studies and his team and without their support we would not have been able to host these programs over these months the first program in september was a sort of curtain raiser which looked at various issues relating to china which included of course the media as well but it was a very small capsule the second program looked at cyber security and cyber capabilities of china and how india could counter them uh, we had a crack security uh, uh, a cyber security team uh, based in bombay singapore and bangalore who sort of shepherded that program very well uh, and of course last month we had the one that focused on maritime uh, security the maritime context at, as we called it was a two day program which which went off very well and so now the we are back to the media game again and uh, this we thought would be interesting especially for those who are covering issues related to china and i'm really happy that we've had a very good uh day of deliberation so far i think it started with ambassador bambawale who was also very agreeable to take questions and that sort of enlivened the whole program uh let us get this going i know it's lunch time it's 110 but somehow we've managed to uh, come back to time for those of you who don't know mr raghavan srinivasan uh i'm sure there are very few here at least who don't he retired in august this year as the editor of the hindu business line and uh, there of course his focus he says was on building alternate revenue streams and a digital future for the product he he of course conceptualized some major event properties which included the change maker awards the hindu business line agri summit etc all that was done to bring in revenues he also created a special line of of publications and books including creating a tamil subsite so a very successful tenure uh but of course i have known mr srinivasan uh, several years ago but what he is now and what he has been for many years over the uh, over time he is better known as a senior business journalist and columnist who has been reporting analyzing and interpreting the india growth story since the inception of economic reforms in india which goes back to 1990s or so early 1990s and even prior to the start of reforms mr srinivasan was one of the pioneers of of what is called corporate journalism in india bringing first hand experience and insight to reporting on indian businesses ever since he switched to journalism after a decade long stint in marketing in major corporates i think that experience would have helped him with the hindu business line he has also been an investigative journalism of which a few of us might know he was responsible for breaking major stories including those relating to the harshad mehta stock scam a stock scam the return of coke to india and the collapse of uti among others Mr Srinivasan has a good understanding of the digital transformation of legacy newsrooms I, I I think all of you know what legacy newsrooms mean you know uh at uh, having moved to the business line into subscription based digital offering for both website and e paper and piloting a unique hybrid wall now we are talking about hybrid because even events are now going to be hybrid we are going to have virtual events and we might have if we get the vaccine on time and we are all safe we might have the old fashioned events but it is going to be hybrid from now on over the past 3 decades mr srinivasan has led editions and held senior editorial positions in major newsrooms across india 
including the Times of India, the Indian Express, the Hindustan Times, Mail Today, the Financial Express. I think that was where I met him first many years ago and the Business Standard. And he's been managing teams ranging from a handful to several hundred in number in diversified settings and cultures. He has also launched editions of the Times of India in Hyderabad and Pune and, having, and has been a part of the launch teams of the Hindustan Times in Bombay and Mail Today. He carries a deep insight into political issues at the granular level across India. As some of us must have surely noted by some of his comments or questions early on to the ambassador. One of Mr. Srinivasan's other areas of interest is to engage with students of journalism through interactions and guest lectures. I remember him coming to the Bharat Vidya Bhavan where I was lecturing at one point in the early 90s and he readily agreed to come and speak to the students there. He has worked on developing a business journalism course for the Asian College of Journalism in association with Bloomberg and Mint. He was also scholar in residence at Christ University, Bangalore, running classes and seminars for students and faculty in journalism, management and the international studies departments. So it's a pleasure having you, Mr. Srinivasan. I'm really happy you are here. Over to you. You can chair the session. Just unmute yourself, please. Thank you very much, Sashi, for that extensive uh, introduction. Uh, since we've been discussing a lot about propaganda and misinformation, I must tell you that I wrote that introduction myself. So you should take it with more than a pinch of salt. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, so uh, thank you for uh, be you know staying with us through, of course, a very interesting at a long mornings program. Um, uh, for the final session today. I am delighted to have an extremely erudite and uh, expert panel uh, for you here. Uh, I would like to first introduce Colonel Hariharan. He served as a military intelligence specialist on South Asia, as well as terrorism and counterinsurgency for most of his nearly three decades of military service. And um, operationally, he's been uh, involved with the India-Pakistan wars in Kutch in 65, East Pakistan, now Bangladesh in 1971, and counterinsurgency operations in Assam, Manipur, Mizoram, Nagaland, Tripura, and Bangladesh. And um, he was the head of the intelligence uh, of the IPKF in Sri Lanka in 1987 to 1990. He's uh, a... A recipient of the Vasish Seva Medal, and post his retirement from the Army in 1991, he's uh, served as the Executive Director of the Madras Management Association, uh, Chennai. Uh, he's associated with the Chennai Center for China Studies, the South Asia Security Analysis Group, and the International Law and Strategic Analysis Institute, Chennai. So, strategic analysts of um, global repute, I may say. Uh, welcome, Colonel Hariharan. Our other speaker uh, is Lieutenant General Bajwa, uh, uh, you know, who's the editor of the Indian Defense Review. Um, he superannuated after 39 years in the Army. He served in most of the country's border areas and in counter-terrorist operations in Jammu and Kashmir. He was Chief of Staff Eastern Command. He's been Commandant of the OTA in uh, Chennai uh, and later of the infantry school in Mao uh, before taking over as the DG infantry at army headquarters. He's a recipient of the Param Vasish Seva Medal, Uttam Youth Seva Medal and Sena Medal. He has a postgraduate degree in defense studies with an MPhil in defense and management studies and a doctorate in defense and strategic studies. Uh, all this besides being a full-time soldier um, uh, quite incredible. And he's uh, the author of three books, Modernization of the PLA, Modernization of Chinese PLA from Mass Militia to Force Projection, and India's Security and Regional Geopolitical Imperatives. Uh, Professor Chengapa, you already know, he just shared the previous session. Um, he also happens to be an old friend, a former colleague uh, uh, as well in a couple of places. 
um, and uh, one who very successfully made the transition from journalism to hardcore academics. Uh, you know, he after uh, a good long stint in journalism, he uh, went and you know did further research work, got his doctorate, worked as a research scholar. Um, you know, with the IDSA. Um, has and and then you know finally uh, you know he's he's been teaching at Christ University um, as associate professor teaching international relations strategy uh, and strategic studies, uh, but he's always uh, continued to write um, and he's also the author of two books: India-China relations post-conflict phase to the post-Cold War period, and Pakistan Army, Islam, and foreign policy. Uh, Mr. Satyamurti is also... Uh, yeah. Mr. Srinivasan, yeah. Mr. Satyamurti says he is having some breathing difficulty, so he may not be able to join. All right. So, yeah, so we okay. will have this and maybe we can have uh, a Komodo Vasan or someone else later if you need. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so, you know, the, the, the question, you know, we looked at uh, specifically in this uh, today's session, we've looked at the issue of uh, the media landscape uh, in within the context and the prism of uh, the India-China relationships. Uh, and I think the session title is a very logical question to ask. So where do we go from here? What do we do next? Um, just to set the context of how China is viewed in newsrooms and in news organizations, just as background information, um, it is uh, that uh, uh, even today, I mean, you know, uh, despite the noise level going up uh, considerably, particularly in the electronic media television, uh, post the border, uh, you know, tension escalation, uh, China remains uh, pretty much uh, really below the radar in terms of, uh, you know, regular focus, uh, editorial focus in most Indian newsrooms. Uh, we are far more Western oriented. Um, and of course, uh, intensely focused on Pakistan, but China much less so. There is a lack of expertise, uh, which is quite significant uh, within most Indian media organizations as far as China is concerned. Uh, more importantly, Indian media has, particularly over the last uh, two decades or so, increasingly turned its focus inwards. Uh, I, I think the Hindu group is one of the few honorable exceptions which has tried to maintain a presence of uh, its own correspondence uh, internationally. Uh, but most uh, Indian ma uh, major media uh, organizations now uh, no longer bother sending their own foreign correspondents. The foreign correspondent as a species is nearly extinct, the Indian foreign correspondent. And uh, uh, they rely on other you know exchange arrangements with other organizations from the various countries uh, or stringerships and so on so you know there is no sustained uh, focus there is no uh, there is a severe lack of internal expertise and there is a considerable lack of interest overall in doing sustained reporting on china so what we do is so dip in and out whenever there is an escalation or a spike in interest in some area, whether it is economic or whether it is military or political or strategic. Uh, you know, COVID-19, of course, caused another spike in this. Age, but, you know, it's, it's very superficial. It's sort of helicoptering in and out. Uh, and uh, that is something which I think as a strategy, as a country, now we need to look at. We need to look at how... How do we sort of get a better understanding of uh, of China uh, as a country? Uh, more importantly, how do we sort of ensure that because media is absolutely critical in transmitting uh, a, you know this perception and ideas and understandings of China uh, to a large mass audience? Uh, how do we get them to engage with it? So these are, I think, some of the issues that we need to ponder on uh, going forward, uh, just by way of uh, some background. Uh, I would now uh, like to hand over first to Colonel uh, uh, Hariharan. Hey. 
uh, for uh, your session. I think uh, if we can stick to roughly about 18 minutes each, we should be okay on time. Over to you, sir. Uh, uh, firstly, from the morning, I, we have had uh, very erudite uh, uh, scholars speaking on uh, China and Chinese media. I want to clarify one thing. The media dynamics have changed. I am a guy who qualified in journalism in the uh, 60s. And I can see now there is a world of uh, perceptional difference. So I would like to clarify how, because there is a general acceptance of Chinese media as any other media. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it is a very correct perception. Uh, as I have said in the uh, slide, you can see the social dynamics have changed over the years, uh, particularly knowledge revolution and uh, the, uh, the quest for uh, what you call consumerism have taken over and uh, the ideology is now practically dead. Even though China calls itself a communist country, of, co of course, of uh, Chinese vintage, uh, it has ceased to be uh, what it was originally. So we see it's fallout everywhere. Even in our, uh, what you call, all, uh, as I can say, all the holy cows of medias have become ordinary buffaloes. So that somebody invests in the buffalo and milks it. There is a profit model. I'm sorry if I uh, disillusion the hallowed status of media. But this is happening all over. Uh, it is not only in uh, China. It is in India. Unless you have a business model. As Mr. Srinivasan himself had achieved. You have to be dynamic to run a newspaper and uh, keep up, keep pace with this. So this readily accepts processed information. Uh, and uh, the multi multimedia uh, presentations are available. Uh, I keep appearing on uh, TV channels. And uh, I have seen generally the, the short time for you given to the panelists to explain your viewpoint is uh, 10, 10 seconds to 12 seconds on any key issue. In Tamil media, of course, the issues are larger, the polemics are bigger, so they allow me to speak longer. But in the English media, I have seen they want me 12, 12 seconds. So because the uh, uh, focus time itself is very much less of the audience. When I uh, did journalism, I remember in Madras University, I, I was taught the New York Times survey that the lead sentence, the lead of the story, that is the first sentence, the Americans have found that six to eight words. Beyond that, they don't read the story. If it is more than 10, 12 words, that even in those days, it was like that. Now, the very short uh, period only, the audience attention can be drawn for any story. So the long stories, the what you call the hallowed editorial writers, they have to come back to the ground. They have to appear on the YouTube or uh, adopt other means. This is what is happening. When we come to uh, Chinese media, earlier I think uh, Tilak and Namruta had given enough background that it is a propaganda machine of the uh, Communist Party, not of the government or China. It is of the Communist Party because it has got historical origins uh, from 52 onwards, even the Xinhua and uh, uh, the CNS came to uh, became news media. It was to carry out the propaganda of the uh, Maoist period. That is how it originated. Uh, next slide, please. Shivani, next one. No, not this one, please. 
Yeah. This is the one. So, the media is part of uh, China's statecraft. Unlike democracies, we need to understand this difference. So, let us not equate that Chinese media is free or not. It is immaterial whether it is free or not because it is propagating Chinese Communist Party's strategic objectives. There should be absolutely no doubt about it. And it is the Xinhua and the Chinese China News Service, the two prime agencies, or one is uh, both uh, Xinhua is both internal and external. CNS mainly focuses, used to focus on overseas Chinese. Now it has graduated uh, to uh, across the world, particularly Western world. And both of them have very strong influential links with the, the so-called free world media. It is not that they exist in vacuum. They are all, uh, you can see, uh, Xinhua operates 170 foreign bureaus and in every province and every, what do you call, city-state, they have a representative uh, office and in every, uh, what you call, autonomous region, they have. So, they carry out the propaganda as news. Forget about global uh, times. Even China Daily, or I, I read the PLA Daily, uh, uh, and the comments in PLA Daily, or uh, the military news, English, they focus on uh, force projection of a Chinese point of view. Every photograph that appears, for instance, in PLA Daily, is to uh, project China as a very powerful power. We do not do that because we are a democratic uh, country. Our, I, I doubt very much uh, there is no equivalent of state media like Doordarshan uh, doing this kind of thing because it is not done in the way it is done in China. Or take BBC. BBC was conceived in 1932 by a royal charter. And BBC, a tax is collected from every British citizen, a television tax. That is the source of public finance. Of course, they have got into a corporate model. Overall, BBC is one of the largest. But it is accountable. BBC's accounts, you can access it. Even I access BBC's accounts, public accounts. It is, uh, questions are asked in parliament. Till 1980, BBC had a link with the MI5 because MI5 is there uh, like our uh, IB, Intelligence Bureau. Internal vetting of BBC uh, staff appointment was done. It had a role like China is controlling. But in 1980, it was given up when the issue was raised. So, what I'm, BBC is a very big, it has built its own empire. It employs 32,000 people. But it is qualitatively different from Xinhua. They will even question government policy, BBC. Can you imagine Xinhua doing it? Because it is party driven, not because it is state driven. So this is one point we should not forget because it is Chinese offer very attractive. Uh, I have been to China also, attended conferences. And uh, so I am aware they how they project, want to project China. And many of us, particularly from the media, we find it very convenient because uh, uh, everything is packaged very well, a perspective. And take social media. Social media is fully 
uh, as a matter of fact in china a, every it company whether private or public company has to uh, the uh, help the government in monitoring or, or giving a feedback to the government requirements to meet the intelligence requirements here also they do it we do it i have been a mi man i had access to media in very much but it was done on a on, on a demand or a threat because i had uh, established good rapport personally and uh, with that it was a informal arrangement so we have to when we talk of uh, china the or uh, tibet the moment i mentioned tibet in an article i am sure somewhere a bell rings because i get uh, unsolicited uh, mail in uh, chinese though i don't speak chinese i am sure it is because of that uh, or uyghur i have been always uh, arguing about for a number of years on the human rights of uyghurs or xinjiang province so the the uh, actually they, there are uh, bots which will pick it up in uh, the social media and feed it so when we talk of handling chinese media it is not going to be i totally agree with uh, 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 professor telakja that it is not uh, it has to be holistic i am not going to repeat what is in the slide and focus on uh, next one please hello yeah we need to develop a counter narrative strategy we have to create an academic base this uh, counter narrative strategy a uh, strategy itself is long term so it is not going to happen overnight we have to have an academic base of china studies which we don't have it is the think tanks two think tanks few departments six universities only offer actually two universities offer doctoral level uh, studies in chinese so we have there are actually 32 if i remember correct 32 institutions offering uh chinese teaching in the whole country out of which only six universities offer worthwhile degrees there are not at any time that are not more than 120 to 200 scholars studying in this unless we create this base there won't be we will not understand chinese it is my great regret i didn't study chinese and uh, can you please go back to the slide please um uh, my boy sir shivani is having some difficulties i will uh, up the switch again for you sir okay anyway it doesn't matter so the unless we create that base we will not be able to handle the requirement of trying to pick the best guys to do the job especially the when we come to what media can do i i will focus on this aspect uh, for the simple reason then the government communication has to be qualitatively it has to be multimedia multimodal because we are a free country if we are not we don't have a captive audience like we have uh, and it has to be interactive we have to graduate to that level and media has to be taken into confidence i think earlier also mr satyamurthy pointed out and uh, i think uh, commodore vasan also pointed out the public has to get uh, information 
and media has to be taken into confidence on a regular basis and you should be able to respond to criticism because we are a democratic society this is the answer for the china's autocratic way of propaganda then you can demolish it because the media will have greater confidence in the government utterance then we should respond in real time this is where i appreciate the americans they respond in real time to any chinese comment official comment we are not doing it sometimes we don't know what is our stand because there is a contradictory information and this is all of us are to certain extent we are informed that uh, how about the ordinary citizen and it has to be in vernacular these days i am writing in tamil uh, my strategic analysis because i find from the uh, interacting with the tamil media so much appalling ignorance they are following the uh, chinese media only so uh, i am saying it must be in multiple languages then we have to strength strengthen technology surveillance there is no other way there is uh, overt and covert operations i am sure uh, the especially cns had been operating like this cns is running newspapers in some of the western countries and i am sure uh, at least one uh, newspaper has been bought over by chinese uh, front organizations i won't be surprised if it happens or if it doesn't happen it is not a question of uh, loyalty or nationality it is pure business sense that might drive people to do this and uh, social media uh, surveillance already i think there is some strategy afoot and uh, to identify fake news fake news is flooding not only from china from all over the world so uh, we have to do this uh, next one please that is my final slide and i will end with that shivani Uh, india indian media has to be drawn into any counter narrative there is no other go we let us have faith in our media they are all as uh, nationalists as we are they are as loyal to the flag that is flying so let us not uh, uh, berate the media though i i they they are running a business all of us are running a business of some sort so the media has to uh, there is very little uh, knowledge of chinese i am talking of the multilingual media i am not talking specifically of the english media which of which has a small layer only it addresses among the indian audience there is very little language skill chinese language skill there is very little understanding of developments in china i think these require running of packages uh, i would suggest even to uh, sashi to run this on understanding this for specific language uh, inputs you, and op-eds must be realistic not cut and paste job i am sorry to say uh, many guys carry cut and paste or ready made stuff you have to have uh, constantly uh, opinion makers get in touch with them and let us not be overawed by chinese claims they are, they are making all sorts of fantastic claims you had recently about using uh, what is that uh, a microwave <laughs> gun making it, that so called thing has got 80 meter range i remember janak shankar was saying 80 meters is a long dis distance when you are sitting on top of a mountain in ladakh it means nothing still there was a propaganda and people were media fellows were asking me my opinion the us had developed this my long time long term back then 
Let us not be totally conditioned by Western world comments. Why do we want certification from the West? This is always, unfortunately, I call it a colonial mindset. How we are doing or what we are doing. Why do we need certification from the Western media? We don't need it. We should be uh, what you call, uh, uh, Nehru once said, success comes to those who dare and act. We have to have our say. Let us not be cowed down by what New York Times or uh, WSJ says or this thing. I find we are wasting too much time on commenting on comment. Let us have our narrative very clear what we want to do. And we have to read more of Chinese media, analysis of Chinese media. There are enough scholars who have fled from China who are writing in various uh, open source media in Australia and in US, Hong Kong, and in many places. Please read the European media also. And uh, uh, there is no other way we will come to grips with the, the media has to do uh, some hard work. With this, I will, I think I have run out of my time. I will close. If there are any questions, I am prepared to handle it. Thank you. Thank you, Karni uh, Hariharan. I think um, we have two options. Uh, we can either take uh, questions for each speaker uh, or uh, all together at the end. I prefer the latter option um, because it sort of gets, uh, gives the chance to everybody to get a rounded perspective from all the speakers before you actually frame your questions. So uh, I would now like to... Uh, 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 you know, move on. Thank you, uh, uh, Colonel Hariharan, for a very uh, insightful uh, presentation. I can assure you that all your information on the media is absolutely up to date and current. It's not from the 60s. It's very much the picture which is uh, there today. Um, you see, the, the 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 one of the big problems uh, with Indian media is it's uh, and unfortunately that has been driven by the sort of business model practiced by the largest players in the space uh, has been a very sharp reduction over the years in the kind of investment this make in news gathering which by news gathering i mean all this put together developing the expertise uh, devoting you know human resources and financial resources uh, beefing up your own capability with external arrangements and so on all that is given a secondary this thing so you know if you can if you can manage with a shortcut you use it and that's why we are commenting on comments we are sort of using cut and paste job it's a sad reality uh, uh, that uh, has taken place because uh, i think i personally think it's a misinterpretation of what business pressures have meant and what uh, what should have been the response in newsrooms uh, and news managements for that but that's a subject of another debate. Uh, uh, turning uh, to, uh, to you, sir, uh, General Patra, so uh, if you could uh, now take the floor. Jain, Namaskar. And I think uh, there are a lot who are feeling very hungry. I'll just put on my timer. I'll try, try to stick to 15 minutes at the most. And Colonel uh, Hari Haryan has uh, very comprehensively touched upon of what is our uh, shortcomings and where we need to go and where we need to emphasize. I'll, I'll talk more towards what the Chinese do and what we are not doing to counter that. The first point came up, uh, you know, everybody really covered it that uh, the, you must look at China as not as a country which has got a, a media which is independent. You know, it's like a political party in India. They all have their own selves. They have their uh, cells which are promoting or propagating or projecting their point of view, and uh, the uh, and then you know a political party turns around and says India is Indra and Indra is India. It applies to China. China is the CCPB and CCPP uh, CCP is China. 
and so therefore everything that is oriented uh, anywhere in china is going to be to project the party the party point of view and present the party as the most successful uh, entity in china and they don't want to take any criticism so uh, that's and they are able to do it very well uh, you know um, of uh, how the outside can be uh, information will never reach a chinese and how what the chinese uh, communist party wants to tell the people is what the people will be told i give an example when i was part of the uh, china study group, the uh, you know the joint working group and the expert group on the question of the boundary uh, we often visited china there they they came here we go to china you stay in a five star and you see these uh, all the clocks which is showing different standard times of various countries there is pakistan standard time but there is no clock which will show you indian standard time you watch cctv there the uh, the chinese tv and they are talking of the Chinese, the karachi stock exchange but they don't talk of the indian stock exchange so i asked one uh, local there once uh, he, he said where are you from i said you guess he said you you uh, are a pakistani you know they pronounce pakistan as pakistani i said no no i am from india he said oh you are hindu hindu so the indian information is never reaching them that is a problem with them so the chinese initially up to 1998 they had a department called the central propaganda department as bombay wala ambassador had also brought out it was changed to the central publicity department in india we don't have any such equals there is supposed to be a propaganda cell with the ministry of home affairs but i in the the free for all uh, media environment in our country i don't think that can ever present any point of view give a small uh, connection narrative here on uh, on this issue of ladakh on 5th of august uh, 2019 when the this debate was going on in the parliament i happened to be somewhere where uh, i was you know waiting room waiting for my turn to be uh, to call be called up there by a doctor actually i saw the tv and they were presenting you know the uh, the map of jammu and kashmir with the, on this decision of the 370 and the union territories coming up so they presented uh, the the maps that were being projected was uh, jammu and kashmir as in one color ladakh in the second color and the third color was aksai chip uh, by chance i noticed this it was one of the hindi tv cha- news channels so i had a one of the officers who was with the uh, the the adg the public information group of the army headquarters he was he had served with me as one of my staff officers earlier so i rang him up and i said why are you trying to indicate that ladakh has an a portion which is not under ladakh and it is under china i said you got an opportunity here today to actually present quite clearly to the rest of the world that aksai chain is part of ladakh and there should be no doubt about it he promptly took on this and told the news channel to change it and thereafter the on that day for that period there were only two colors being shown on the map one was jammu and kashmir including pok and the other was ladakh including aksai chip and i told him that since i have been with the uh, joint working group and knew this issue of the of uh, the india china border uh, major problem i said this is going to irk the 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 chinese a lot but that's how it should be let it, let it be known but why should it have it have been an individual like me who was was a retired officer doing it why should it not have come uh, from something uh, from the official side whether the nea or the army headquarters so 
we saw let all this thing pass very casually and we are not very particular about it but it makes all a lot of difference so i was uh, pretty amused to learn when uh, recently there was uh, this what was being uh, published as the sg shirvastav group which which was a uh, an ngo from uh, called the eu disinformation lab when they announced and put out uh, that there is a group in india which has been presenting and targeting pakistan since 2005 uh, and that uh, the major player in this uh, is the wire services the ani and has been amplifying content which produced on fake media outlets in 2019 he says that this group uncovered 256 pro indian websites operating across 65 countries if that is what we have achieved i think that's a remarkable thing if we and if we are not aware of it uh, <laughs> then we should uh, we should propagate it and if chinese can do it that way why should we 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 be targeted and you know there's a pakistani author who uh, put this put this article out in the diplomat so he was only really focusing on that uh, you know that the arrangement of those eu uh, members of parliament that visit was arranged by this shirvastav group then in the however uh, he did not mention anything about china also being targeted by this group however the chinese media again i come to the global times they chipped in and saying that it, it, the, this group has been targeting china also so there there is a chinese scholar uh, ching fang who is a director of research department on national strategic institute at the singwa university he goes on to say that india's political interests and the government's cyber security and intelligence service organizations are highly likely to be playing a major role behind the scenes and he further says that the fake news sites created by the uh, shrivastava group have a long history with expertise invisibility deception and flexibility and thus unlikely to be spontaneous civilian activity i i i it's very impressive if this is what is happening and if we are, if it is not true then it is it's sad that somebody else is doing it for us you know deng's uh, policy of you know his uh, 24 character strategy has been totally abandoned by uh, xi jinping but deng deng had very you know this 24 character strategy to quote it he says that observe calmly secure, secure our positions cope with affairs calmly hide our capabilities and bide our time be good at maintaining a low profile never claim leadership china still don't claim leadership but everything else is abandoned it operates behind uh, i mean i see china operating behind a, a facade a facade where what they say is everything is diplomatically very correct but what they do is quite opposite that how is it that we have not been able to understand that why since 2013 whenever a senior uh, official the government official was visiting india there was something happening on the lac in 2013 it was at uh, debsa and the prime minister of china was visiting here uh, the li chinjing 2014 it happened and this this impasse carried on for 14 days the stand off in 2014 it was chumar and uh, demchok it carried on for 21 days and that is when uh, xi jinping was visiting and then it of course went into 2017 doklam with 73 days it is uh, our media gets uh, focused on the uh, issue that is happening on ground there is nobody the think tanks those who are uh, you know china watchers none of them have been able to 
you know, put their uh, mind to it that why is this happening and why did they do it? Is there some link? You know, is there uh, the strategic, uh, the, the volume that the, the study of Chinese military strategy of 2013 brings out that they are actually working to a very uh, a formula to enhance uh, their, uh, their reach everywhere. And there we have not taken, you know, we did a very superficial study of that, uh, the study of military strategy of 2013. Another one came out in 2017. So our think tanks uh, are not focusing and concentrating on these things. I think. Now, uh, you know, these actions in that show that everything is always coordinated. There are three warfares is very clear. And the three warfares is talking of uh, the public opinion, which they, whether it is their own opinion and the international community opinion, they create a narrative to ensure that everybody takes that one narrative as the final narrative or their narrative and that narrative is true and there is a psychological warfare which is always waged and the third is a legal warfare in fact uh, in, in this case of the Ladakh uh, impasse there are uh, papers which are coming out from the uh, the academy of uh, Chinese academy of uh, sciences and social studies that now, a new narrative is being created to bring out that the, uh, the status of Ladakh as a territory of India is also questionable. So, if they created that narrative in Arunachal Pradesh, they are doing that a similar such narrative here in uh, Ladakh. That historically, has Ladakh ever been part of India? and uh, was it part of Tibet. So, this is a new narrative which they are creating and they are saying that uh, now the issue of the LAC is, uh, is, can be sidelined. The issue is not about LAC or the boundary, it is about the status of Ladakh. So, they have created a, a situation which is going to turn the tables on us unless we are prepared for it. Now, uh, the PLA has, uh, has always been part of the entire propaganda machinery of the, the, the CCP. When they came out with this, uh, the three warfares, it was for a political and information pre-kinetic warfare strategy of the PLA. And it was introduced in 2003 in uh, when they revised the political works guidelines for the PLA. Earlier in uh, Mao's time, there was a meeting which was held where Mao had, you know, wanted to dispel the notions uh, or the wrong notions that even his own Communist Party people had when he said that they must understand that the Chinese army is an armed body of the party for carrying out the political task of the revolution. The Red Army fights not merely for the sake of fighting, but in order to help the masses establish revolutionary political power. So there should be no doubt that the government and the army are on the same page and their uh, actions are all coordinated in uh, towards a very simple and straightforward uh, narrative of projecting the CCP and protecting the CCP in power. The other aspect I just want to bring out is that our own media has been brought out, even uh, Colonel Hanyarian had said that, our media presence in, and uh, Mr. Srinivasan also, that our media presence outside is, is not there. Uh, in fact, I had questioned uh, the Doordarshan once on uh, the uh, the PMO site that uh, why how much and uh, 
and what is our doordarshan presence in the rest of the country so the response was that uh, we are projecting in 117 countries the eir is uh, not effective like why did we go we have something like the the bbc or the voice of america in the old times even on radio so our media and our country has been actually always trying to please and appease the chinese uh, give an example when we talk of tibet in 2008 when the olympic flame was passing through delhi the chinese in fact had instructed india that make sure that there is no uh, tibetan up, uh, people who are coming here and protesting while the the flame is passing through delhi and we made sure that it, it is being uh, that there was Uh, a total ban on any movement or action by the Tibetans. Similarly, in um, during the Modi 1.0, the for, at the swearing in, uh, the Dalai Lama had been invited, but he was not invited for the swearing in in Modi 2.0. Why was that? Because again, it was Chinese pressure that time, and then. the chinese had again uh, uh, the you know 85th birthday of the dalai lama nobody wished him from the government side so these are certain things that uh, we we try to appease them and they feel that they can pressurize us into doing what they want us to do there is a security law uh, the national security law of 2015 the the article 2 in that defines the unlimited expanse to what the party in china considers as a threat to it the uh, so the 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 push and anything under that uh, under that article and can say it is a threat to china in 2006 the cmc judged that the pla capability they were not in it is incompatible with winning local informatized wars and therefore hu jintao included everybody into this uh, other agencies into the uh, into this uh, the entire format of narrative formation uh, just for your information i mean i have been in touch right through this uh, process of of the impasse in the dark from may onwards with certain officials in the chinese embassy and uh, they been asking me and uh, at times that why are you doing this and why not this and chinese have only done this so i have been you know and last communication with the gentleman was that he please very frankly say that what is uh, the issue between india and china and uh, give it no holds barred so i have done that with them so i don't know if any other they have accessed or reached out to any other uh, think tank or such body but i gave them uh, uh, a very very candid view of what i think about them and the chinese and what they have done in ladakh i think i have uh, exceeded my time of 15 minutes uh, Anything else that I can add to, or through the questions, that most welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, there are a couple of questions, but like I said earlier, we'll come to the questions at the end. Um, uh, you know, I just want to, you know, mention a couple of things, just co comments or anecdotes, really. Uh, you mentioned about wrong maps. Uh, you know, it's such a simple thing. Um, most indian news media organizations you know they they have to depend on maps for uh, on foreign agencies maps of india if you want to get the authentic map from survey of india first you have to jump through 22 hoops second it is uh, very very expensive and third they don't supply it in a format which is usable by the media we need it as what are called vector graphics which can be resized and manipulated you know 
uh, it's such a simple thing for the government to do. It should these maps should be available. Official sanctioned maps should be available for free download on the PIP website uh, for any any media organization to use because it's in your interest that you give the correct. Instead of which we actually you know and quite often Western uh, agencies uh, do not f follow the Indian uh, uh, stand on the boundary uh, depiction. And then you will print the wrong map, and then the government will swing into action and come down like a ton of bricks on the media house saying that this is actually a punishable, it's a criminal offense. And the editor is the one who's uh, hauled up. So, uh, but you know, we don't, we, we only react to certain things and we don't actually bother fixing the problems. That's part of the problem. Um, the other thing, you know, I just wanted to mention that, you know, the kind of long term approach that China has uh, from a media perspective on on india is uh, you know in 2005 when i was national business editor of the hindustan times station in mumbai i was met by a delegation from xinhua uh, of they said they were journalists uh, editors and uh, they wanted to understand basically how the indian financial system works the stock markets the banking system and so on because they said they wanted to set up a specialized financial bureau in bombay based in bombay uh and you know and they actually did it they set up uh, i think two or three dedicated this thing initially the plan was to hire indians but i think they chickened out and they sent chinese instead uh but you know this is it so they have a very good understanding of uh, indian financial systems the markets the companies the listed companies and so on and they've been building the database it's you know that's the reason why Chinese have invested into most of the major Indian so-called unicorns, the technology startups, which have you know hit billion-dollar valuations, and they've been powered by Chinese investments. And they have a very granular, detailed understanding of you know uh, not just the uh, political or this thing, but also the economic and other issues. And we simply do not invest any you know any uh, effort, uh, resources, or money in trying to understand uh, the, the Chinese perspective. So that, I think, is a problem. But I think we have the perfect person to talk about this uh, uh, much more, uh, Professor Chengappa Bidanda, uh, because he's been both a journalist and, 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 and an academic uh, scholar who's uh, studied China. So I think uh, over to you, Professor Chengappa. Thanks, uh, Srini. So, yeah, we are here today discussing the Chinese media landscape since the morning. Uh, what does that finally boil down to? We just had a lot of hostile uh, incidents across the border and whatnot. So finally, what is it boiling down to? That India basically needs to fight an information war against China. Just uh, I'll just quote uh, President Xi Jinping's statement in February 2016, where he says, wherever there are readers, wherever there are viewers, that is where propaganda reports must extend their tentacles. Now, in the on the Indian side, is the political leadership or is the civilian leadership really thinking on these lines? I've got my serious doubts. I'll just take you back to the since there are two uh, army officers here, former DG infantry and Colonel Hariharan Saab, who's been an Int Corps officer. 1986-87, Sumdrong Chu. What happened? I was just embarking on my PhD about a year or two later. And you couldn't make any sense out of Sumdrong Chu. Till I talked to former Eastern Army Commander General VN Sharma and whatnot. You can't, you, the, the, the political communication or the strategic communication on the part of the government of India was, was pathetic. And if you're trying to fight an information war against China, I logically and naturally would think the Indian Information Service, a very little known service in the government, should be at the forefront. Now, the Ministry of External Affairs, the true blue Indian Foreign Service officers like uh, Ambassador Gautam Bambawale, they are fighting it. But what are the their Indian Information Service officers posted in diplomatic missions with the intelligence establishment? What is their role? How do they understand it? I have seen during Kargil outside the DGMI's office, there should be a lot of journalists coming in. Well, the point is, why do you do it only in a crisis? Why can't you do it in peacetime? 
Fortunately, the Ministry of External Affairs, unlike the Ministry of Defense, has an external publicity cell, which is headed by a Joint Secretary level officer from the Foreign Service. But the Ministry of Defense has an Indian Information Service officer who is technically deaf and technically blind. He can't, he doesn't know any military matters. He won't give out any confidential stuff. So the army created its own, uh, what do you call, uh, what later became, first it was under MI24 and then it became the, what is now, uh, what public information. You had an ADG and a DDG and all that. Anyway, the point is in this information war against China, we have to be audience centric. And what is our audience? Uh, let me share one uh, small this thing. I, I attended the biggest ever uh, seminar on India-China relations in 1991 February at Teen Murthy in Delhi, where the whole NDC course had come. And there were half a dozen retired uh, former foreign secretaries. And one of them very candidly said, whenever the government is negotiating on the border dispute, the government is not negotiating with China. The government is negotiating with the domestic audience on how much to give away. I mean, this is the tragic state of affairs. Now, in this information war, who is going to lead the interagency channels in the government of India between the Ministry of External Affairs, between the Indian Information Service and the intelligence establishment and the Indian Army is all very, very disparate. The Indian Army, I'm sure General Bajwa Saab and Colonel Hariharan Saab will bear me out. They are, I think, the Eastern Command, the, uh, the Northern Command, and part of the Central Command deal with the Chinese border. Am I right? Now, then how do you sync that with the Indian Information Service and the Ministry of External Affairs? When you had the Sundarong Chu, the kind of confusion that ensued was not funny. Uh, General Sharma has told me that we and uh, Sharma told me that if you if the Indian army followed the MEA's instructions, they would have been chaos. They would have withdrawn up to the Brahmaputra. Anyway, now what is the way ahead? The topic for this panel is the way ahead. Now, I think the government of India needs to be very audience centric. And what would our audience here be? Our audience does not have to be China centric. Our audience has to be the other. Uh, countries in Southeast Asia and in South Asia. I mean, today, this morning, Ambassador Bambawale mentioned India's reluctance to use the word alliance. Well, I find the, the, the concept of collective security is what alliance or coalition all boils down to. Collective security is the only way to tackle China. And how do you get the smaller Southeast Asian countries and the smaller Southeast South Asian countries on your side vis-a-vis -vis China. You, Philippines says straight away, for instance, we can't handle China. The strategic stature of China is something beyond our capability as much as India. Even the Indian army is not too, from my understanding of things as a former military correspondent, the Indian army is not too geared for uh, mountain warfare, despite the mountain divisions and whatnot. Uh, an army headquarters reserve unit was moved in 2005-06 to the China border. This is one of those army headquarters units which otherwise is stationed in JNK, one of our couple of special forces units. The point is now, how does, what is the message you have to give to the smaller countries of Southeast Asia and South Asia? That if you, if you keep silent about China now, it's like what happened with the Hitler and the Nazis. If you keep silent tomorrow, if they are eating into territory in uh, uh, Ladakh, tomorrow they will eat into territory, into your territory. So we all need to band together. Silence is not an option or ignore the threat because at some point the problem will become yours. The smaller countries should be told. Japan invaded China in the 1930s and thereafter Japan invaded Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Philippines and Malaysia and Myanmar subsequently. So this is a very collective security problem of dealing with China. For instance, how does the government of India amplify the message about Zambia in Africa? You know, the sec I'm talking about the second scramble for Africa where China, India and the other countries are uh, trying to, you know, garner resources. Uh, Zambia is now unable to pay back its debt to China and says, you go to hell, we are not paying the debt back. So. How do we, India's soft power is all fine. People may like Bollywood movies, they may like Indian food and all that. But that is not going to endear them to India. 
India's infrastructure is not good, as one of the earlier Tilak Jha mentioned, Dr. Tilak Jha. We don't have anything good here. I mean, the infrastructure, if you look at Bangalore vis-a-vis -vis Shanghai, uh, some journalists were come were laughing. They said Shanghai is somewhere else, Bangalore is somewhere else. To say Bangalore is India, Shanghai is, is, is an insult to Shanghai. I remember recently uh, a retired army officer, a 70, 72 year old army officer told me he went to China for a holiday. He came back so enamored with China. He said, it's such a fantastic country and you know, it's, it's so nice and all that. So now the thing is, who in the government of India will take the lead? Obviously, you can't expect the private media to uh, do this kind of thing. The private media is very profit oriented. It is how a within the government of India interagency channels swing into action to deal with the China problem. Like uh, General Bajwa mentioned the ANI story. That was a very, very impressive story. But how? But I was also told by media professionals it was a very amateur attempt. It should have been far more slick. I mean, uh, the Indian Information Service should measure up. Now, again, messaging, political messaging or political communication or strategic communication has its limitations. Finally, it is the product that sells. If India is an attractive investment destination, nothing will stop. Uh, foreign direct investment into India. So this is an information war that India has to win vis-a-vis -vis China. And for that, economic heft is necessary. Today, China has that economic heft. It's got the military heft. And uh, what was India doing all these years? Even the road infrastructure along the uh, uh, border with China, in India's uh, the, num the amount of money that India has put in there vis-a-vis -vis the amount of money that China has put in there are two different stories. So collective security is the only way out to deal with the China problem. And in order to get more and more allies on your side and turn the tables against China, strategic communication is a crucial ingredient for this information war. On that note, I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Chengapa. I think, uh, you know, you've raised some very, very important uh, points out here. Uh, first and foremost, I think the need for greater professionalism, that's uh, never in doubt, particularly on part of the government, equally so on part of the media itself in India. Uh, I think that there are severe challenges uh, in, in terms of, you know, also getting a mindset change uh, like i said in newsrooms china is you know because uh, you know it, it's it's not a potential market uh, for uh, indian media uh, houses in any way you know there are language issues uh, you know other regulatory breach uh, issues so it, it just doesn't interest uh, and i think that uh, uh, you know the the people who are directly linked with the chinese economy and uh, who uh, uh, interact with it most straight, uh, closely which actually in india lack a voice with the media which is the msme sector if you look at it um, they are the ones who are importing all the this they they make some of this thing you know they make you know whatever components of finished products here a lot of the inputs are from china but it's it's not just a large organized sector but lots of msmes who are involved uh, likewise the you know the trader uh, you know we, we run a huge uh, deficit trade deficit with china and uh, yeah, so you know the people who have uh, economic and other connections with china did the lack of voice um, media doesn't have I think you know it's not sufficiently once in a while when there is a crisis yes the government's propaganda missionary swings in particularly with television and there's a lot of noise uh, uh, you know uh, on the channels and again it's not a very professionally done job you know it, uh, it, it, it is so clearly obviously orchestrated that nobody takes these things very seriously and that's that's sort of self-defeating. If you want to, first of all, win your domestic audience, you need to also do a better job of that, a more professional job. Um, and I think that there are ways to solving this. Uh, very importantly, I think, you know, media, we, we are fundamentally different from China in the sense that our media is largely privately owned and independent. 
but the government can do certain things to help. Uh, for instance, I think working out tax breaks for specific investments in news gathering directed at China might help. I mean, it might encourage certain news, you know, organizations to sort of put some money into these things. It's uh, you know, so there are multiple options. So uh, we'll just move, take a couple of questions. Um, uh, I would need some help uh, if from, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Balat, uh, in case somebody raises a hand and I can't see them on the screen. I have a couple of questions on the chat box. Um, I'll take that uh, from Mr. Seshadri Vasan. Um, the, he has a question for General Bajwa um, on your observations, sir, on how you had to intervene uh, in the media narrative on Aksai Chen. And his question is, uh, how can we ensure that there is uh, a good media government interface as seen during the Kargil uh, episode? Uh, you know, let me just uh, narrate another incident of 2013. The, the, the Debsang, uh, the, the incursion and the ingress by the Chinese and the impasse that followed. One of these uh, TV channels had come to me and took, uh, I mean, I had just retired then. And they came and asked me a, a question and I gave them what I thought should have happened and the need for coordination there, the ITBP is there, the army is there, both are not. Uh, there is no coordination between the two in their operations. They function quite independently of each other. Till when one can't handle it, the other is asked to now take over. So, and there are there were certain restrictions which have been put. I took the, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the name of the China Study Group. And it so happened in Parliament, the the Defence Minister had made a statement and this interview was released just around that time, which was not in sync with what he said. So the oppositions had raised an issue. And uh, by the evening, there was a letter to the Army Headquarters, why should the, the officer not be charged under the Official Secrets Act? for having used the word China Study Group. Now I see the China Study Group is banded about everywhere. But there, that time, it was uh, it was something you can't, you can't utter without having disclosed some state top secret <laughs> element. So, you, you know, we, we, we must be clear. Are we, if you want to protect all information, then keep the media out and have your own newspaper or your own media cell which is going to issue a news, uh, daily newspaper or a news, uh, you give out your news report on television uh, as an exclusive government channel. And uh, that is what has happened. And it was a, a change that occurred in 1999. But this time in Ladakh, there was, we don't have that concept of either embedded media because uh, it, it, um, as was done by the Americans in uh, the Iraq war. So, we still are, uh, you know, we take decisions which we don't want to disclose that we have taken such a decision. Uh, give another example of this. In 1962, during the war, everything that transpired in the Ministry of Defense Nothing was recorded as minutes. Uh, it's something which history would always want to know that whatever decisions were taken uh, in any meetings uh, in the, at that level should have been made available to people in the years that that uh, in later years. But here it was Krishna Manor who said that there will be no minutes of any meeting will be recorded. So we are trying to hide things and if you want to, you know, if you are not uh, able to support a decision that you have taken and you want to be hiding these things, uh, we will always have this problem of how much and what to tell the media. And uh, such time we have a very confident government, we are not going to be able to change this uh, policy. 
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Mr. Seshadri Vasan has a hand raised again, I noticed. Uh, anybody else has a is there anybody sir, else? Yes. Sir, with, with your permission, there is a second question by Commodore Vasan, sir. OK. Uh, yes, I think sir. I'll uh, just mention it here itself, because uh, there's nobody else. Uh, must thank Elephant General Bajwa for this first-hand input. My concerns still remain. You know, even after 60 years from 1962, nothing seems to have changed. There's only some hope when Cargill was covered, because we used to have an MEA spokesperson coming there, you know, giving us a complete brief. It also happened after the attacks in, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, post uh, Balwan. So, you know, there appeared to be some kind of uh, sharing of information and uh, having a little more openness in this. But, you know, you can't take on a country like China unless there is coordinated efforts by the MEA, the MOD, the IIF, which uh, Professor uh, Chandrapa brought on. Now, how are we going to bring these up? You know, unless the government of the day realizes the danger of continuing to be so defensive, I don't think we'll move forward. Any of the panelists can take this on and say, how can we change this? Because our effort is to try and change this, not that they don't know. So the question is that we know the situation. Uh, how do we change the status quo? Uh, what, what, how, can, how can we get the government to change? Uh, uh, Bajwa, would you like to take it? Or, uh, Colonel Harir? Uh, yes, go ahead, sir. Uh, I, you see, in 1971 war, uh, when I participated, this uh, information system uh, was tied up with uh, the media uh, because I was uh, one of the interface. It was very well organized before the operation started. Uh, everything was put in place. And uh, that kind of approach, I, I don't understand why we cannot make it permanently. And every day a bulletin would come on what has happened in 71 war, what can be given to the public and what is uh, cannot be given. Of course, future operations and so on. Because, uh, 1971 war was actually the ideally prepared war. In I was in Sri Lanka also, which was a disaster. It is a study in contrast. This kind of information, I think we won the world audience because uh, we had better uh, interface with the media, the international media, whereas Pakistan didn't have that. They didn't prepare. I think we failed to learn. Uh, this is where we should compliment uh, uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi and General Sam Manaksha. Both of them had very good uh, uh, they had very good articulation with the uh, media, the, both the uh, uh, local and international media. Uh, Mr. Modi is a very good communicator, but unfortunately, the the media is uh, somehow there is no not even a media manager uh, for the government, uh, the cabinet. I think, if I am correct, I don't know who is the media uh, manager. So I, I think we should change this mindset. It has to be a permanent thing. At that time, we didn't have a struggle with whether the army PRO. In those days, we had an army PRO. And he will do that, or who will do this? This kind of thing didn't arise. There was a very, we can organize it. I don't know, I'm, I was too junior. I was only a, a captain at that time. So I didn't understand the. The, the chain of uh, command that went into organizing this. It was a very good example, I thought. And of course, in Sri Lanka also, I was, I was thrust upon this. Everything on top of everything else, I cannot do. I cannot appear in public life there. But they, I had to deal with the media also. So it was anachronism anyway, I yeah. think. I think yes. So, uh, can I add a few a point, yeah. Mrs. Jawad? Can yeah. I? Add? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, let's take this example of uh, the you know the briefing to the political parties by the uh, the government in power, 
and that issue of uh, that no territory has been lost in Ladakh. Now, the, 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 all sorts of terminologies are being used that Chinese have captured, Chinese have intruded, Chinese have established a post, uh, they have ingressed, they have transgressed. These are all the terms which are coming up. Now, since this LAC has not been, you know, there is, it's an ongoing discussion with the, uh, the, the, with the Chinese. The process has been ongoing. So, a, a statement which, uh, you know, which should have been actually been more nuanced has been taken in a very different light and made a confusion of the whole issue. So, there is, therefore, when the media is to be told these things, they have to be told very clearly that what the term that you are using, why are you using this and what implication does it have? So having dealt with, you know, in fact, uh, I think uh, the, the word of uh, transgression and incur transgression versus incursion, way back in 1998-99, I remember using it for the first time and said that it will not be an incursion, it is a transgression. And let us use this as a term uh, that whenever our perception of the LAC, and that is all that a soldier needs to know on ground, that what is your LAC? It has been transgressed, it has been transgressed. You are not, uh, a soldier on ground is not required to know what is the Chinese perception. That can be anything. You have to defend your uh, task, which is your LAC will not be crossed by uh, in any way. So, this becomes a little nuanced, which is not very well easily understood. So, that statement was, uh, you know, something which went to the media and the opposition parties uh, created a, a ruckus about it, which was all unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Heblicker, you had a hand raised. Is there a question? Just a simple uh, thought. One of the uh, ideas of organizing this webinar or its predecessors, we had workshops and seminars, was aimed at journalists. And in the sense that the journalists could come to understand what is uh, national security, what is strategy, what are India's national security objectives, interests, how is this achieved, and what is the environment around India's neighborhood, science and technology and things like this. And I generally find that during the course of this four uh, part webinar, the, the, the representation from the media has been far and few. I think uh, while all of us uh, own the fact that we can criticize the government uh, for you know continuing with some colonial approach to sharing inf information, outside the government. But what is preventing the media houses or uh, the media in trying to nominate its representatives to attend such kind of webinars? It is free, of course. It is complimentary. And I think uh, in the last uh, four webinars, we have seen over, over 100 speakers who spoke, who have you know, shared their experiences on the subject of uh, national importance. Now, uh, there is a reference to the Indian Information Service. Uh, at the third uh, webinar, we requested. I requested the uh, DGPIB to to have his representatives attend the webinar on uh, cyber security as well as maritime. He spoke to. Uh, they spoke to the Chennai officer to send somebody. I think the result was zero. I think there is no interest. Thirdly, some of the terminology that have been used, as the general pointed out, or as the colonel would say have been vastly misunderstood. I remember Professor Chagapa talking to us uh, some time back. He says how the army used to have uh, journalists taken to various uh, places in India for an on-the-spot briefing of a subject. I have served the Indian Army for most part of my 38 years of service, right from Rajasthan to Mizoram and uh, the neighboring countries. I think as an institution, the army has much more that it shares with people. But does the media actually partake of what the army offers? I think 
in our conversation in the last half an hour, the shoe was on the wrong foot. I think uh, the media houses need to step up if they want to give India the kind of projection it requires. And the MEA is well get. People are area specialists. They are understood what they have done. In the Ministry of Defense, uh, by virtue of their postings in various sectors, the Army uh, people understand what they're doing. So wise, Air Force, Navy, and others. But if we are to talk about strategic issues, how many of the younger generation really understand what's up ahead? What is the trajectory that we want to follow? I mean, this is what I would like to, you know, place before my colleagues from the media who are on uh, the platform today. I think there's a lot that the other side needs to do because the government is doing what it should be doing or it ought to be doing. That is my observation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think, uh, you know, a very well made point. Uh, something which I mentioned myself in both my opening remarks and other remarks during the course of the discussion that one of the challenges is that uh, there is, as far as China is concerned in particular, there is uh, both a lack of understanding uh, uh, and a lack of internal expertise uh, in media houses, and more importantly, a lack of interest. You know, there is this, uh, this thing. Uh, there is a tendency to sort of uh, take the lowest common denominator approach in newsrooms. Um, there is pressure on everybody, of course, you know, the mass media game, you need numbers. But somehow the thinking seems to be that, you know, you have to sort of, uh, you know, play to the gallery in order to reach the numbers, which is something which I've sort of disputed. But uh, nevertheless, it exists. It cannot be wished away. Uh, more importantly, I think the media also needs, and you know, the government also needs to do a little bit of pushing. I think you know the message they're very good at it. This government, in particular, it has absolutely no problems in controlling, uh, you know, what kind of narrative goes out, particularly with the mass reach media, and you know, television and so on, on particular issues. So why can't it take take this up also? And you know, the thing you mentioned that you know, media houses didn't really nominate anybody for a rich learning experience but you know it, the, these are these are these are these kind of cost benefit uh, uh, analysis decisions uh, which are being taken by news managers on a daily basis uh, or i mean you know if i have one reporter and i you know send him for sort of 8 hours for the seminar what do i get out of it nothing just a better understanding for the reporter he does, they don't see that as a benefit you know they'll say if I deploy part of my limited resources somewhere for four hours or eight hours, how many stories can I get? How much footage will I get? That's uh, unfortunately that's the kind of this thing. You know, uh, in, in the old days, uh, uh, newsrooms had a number of really solid uh, domain uh, specialists. You know, and they developed that expertise over years, maybe 20 years of doing the same beat, and they developed a deep understanding of it. And that's no longer the case uh, anymore so it's it's a reflective of a larger this say and in indian media houses you know we have not yet gone some of the you know the western way in terms of filling these gaps which you have internal gaps that you have in expertise and understanding with uh, crowdsourced but quality controlled stuff like something like what say the guardian does very successfully you know uh, where now uh, outside contributors outnumber Guardian staffers uh, by a good number, um, but there is a there is a proper system of gatekeeping and quality control which ensures that uh, not everything you know uh, just simply gets by. So I think there are a number of things that we could look at uh, in terms of coming up with uh, some you know solutions to the way forward from here. Uh, I think. Uh, what is very, very clear to me is that the responsibility lies on both sides of the fence, whether it is the government, the government has to do several things, whether it is this security establishment, they have to do certain things, and certainly the media has a lot of responsibility for this as well, if it indeed, you know, because it indeed is a national interest prerogative, you know, uh, imperative. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, my panelists once again uh, for... Uh, their uh, uh, valuable input today. So, thank you, and uh, over to you, uh, Sashi. 
Shashi, uh, can I just make a quick comment? A 30 second comment, 20 second comment. Yeah, I'll time you. Yeah, yeah, you can. See, I just wanted to respond to Mr. Heblicker's thing about uh, media's responsibility versus the government's responsibility. I just wanted to flag the difference between state and market. Media is part of the market and it's not part of the state. But if the state, if state gives the direction, the media needs to cooperate. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, before Kabodo Vardu Gopal uh, takes over, does the honors. Uh, thank you, Mr. Srinivasan, for first of all sparing your time to be here, being with uh, with us. I think all through the day, also steering what has been a stimulating discussion. And if I can also add, ending it all on a rather high note. So thank you very much. Much appreciated. Yeah, Kabodo. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for the goof up. Uh, on behalf of the Institute of Contemporary Studies, Bangalore, Press Trust of India and Chennai Center for China Studies, it is my privilege to sum up the day's proceedings and convey the word of thanks. As you all agree, the media is one of the most powerful entity in today's world. It has the power to create and change public opinion with ease. It is far more powerful than the military or any other facet or dimension. They control public discussions, create opinions, change opinions, create sentiments, create realities. The media has the power to literally change societies if they wish to. It can be used as a propaganda machine and an instrument to persuade people into believing the originator's narrative by selective dissemination. Today's last of the series of this high octane session has proved the importance of the media undoubtedly. I take this opportunity to thank the speakers for their brilliant and educative uh, talk in the descending order. Professor M.D. Nalapat, Ms. Namrata Biji Ahoja, uh, represented by Bala Subramanian of the C3S, Professor Naresh Rao, Mr. Murlidran Nair, Mr. Satyamurti, Dr. Tilakja, Dr. Aijab, Aizab, Aijas uh, Wani. And uh, these two the sessions ably and uh, brilliantly chaired by uh, Mr. Pratap Heblika and Dr. Chengapa. And lastly, the eminent panel chaired by Mr. Shini, uh, uh, Mr. Srinivasan, Raghavan Srinivasan, was an excellent uh, uh, closure to the day's proceedings. The panel consisted of Colonel Hariharan, General Bajwa, and Dr. Chengappa. A sincere thanks for the team behind the scene who have coordinated all activities and worked relentlessly to make, make this uh, webinar a uh, uh, and a fantastic closure. A big thanks to Mr. Shashi Nair, Commodore Vasan, and Mr. Pratap Heblika to have steered this interesting webinars through uh, three rounds of four rounds of uh, you know uh, sessions. Last but not the least, the audience who have actively participated in today's uh, proceedings. I'll close my talk by signing off, wishing on behalf of the organizers of this webinar, a very happy uh, Merry Christmas, a very happy New Year, and a happy days ahead in 2021. Thank you one and all.